to drive around and talk about the latest happenings. This is the channel you need, so subscribe and follow Carpentry. What's up, everybody? It's time for another episode of Carmentary. Welcome back. You may notice that I'm driving in a different car. This is our second car. Normally I drive the Daihatsu Wake, which is my everyday car. I love doing the Carmentary episodes in that car. But today I had the opportunity to drive to the far east of Hokkaido and make an exchange for a canoe with a fellow I met a few months ago, or actually a couple years ago. He wanted a down jacket that I had, and I really wanted to have a canoe. And he owns and operates a canoe guiding company on a small lake just outside or near the Kushido Wetlands National Park. Beautiful area. I met him a couple years ago when I was out there shooting. I met him again in February and I had the jacket on and he was like, man, I really love your jacket. I wanted to buy that jacket. And I was like, ding, hey, I don't really need the jacket anymore, but I really want a canoe. What do you think? And he's like, yeah, let's trade. And so I called him up like four or five days ago and said, okay, hey, I'm ready. Uh, I can drive out. And we can make the exchange. So that's what I did. I drove out there last night. I met him early this morning. We made the trade. Uh, my down jacket for the canoe. I have it on top of my car, which is the Mitsubishi Delica D5. And I'm driving home right now. And very, very happy. Now, today's episode is not about the fact that I made a trade, although it can be part of the conversation. Because I really do think that trading things is, I just love that. It's my favorite way to, to get new stuff. I, I don't mind buying things. I purchase stuff through Amazon. I go to stores. I'll do that. But if there's something I have that someone wants and they have something that I want, it's, it's just, it's beautiful. I love that. I love the fact that we can exchange things. And now this fella and I, we have sort of this, this bond that's going to last forever. I'll, he'll always be the guy who gave me his canoe in exchange for my jacket. And that's such a cool thing. It feels, uh, it feels really nice. And I'm also going to bring him up at the end of this talk. Because today's talk is once again about tourism in Japan. So let's jump right into it. I did record something about this a couple days ago, but I didn't feel like I really captured the, the gist of what I was trying to say. And by meeting this fella today, I was able to get a little more insight, and I think I could bring something more to the topic. So I'm going to try to re-record this again. There was a big article in the Nikkei Shimbu, which is the big economic Shimbu, uh, newspaper here in Japan. I read the article online and was talking about Japan, tourism, changes in tourism, the new expectations for tourism, etc, etc. There's a bunch of numbers in there that I thought were interesting. First being, Japan is now the 12th most visited country in the world. Wow! Number 12. There were like, uh, I think it was, it was, it was 31.4 million tourists came to Japan last year. Wow, that's that's a big number. Don't forget, island country, not a lot of people come and buy boats. So that's 31, pe 31 million people coming on airplanes to Japan. They're predicting and aiming for 40 million in 2020. That's next year, it's the Olympic year, Tokyo Summer Olympics. So maybe they're expecting more people for that or it's going to bring more attention to Japan and bring more people. So total 40 million in 2020. And the new number that was in that article that I had not heard before, they're aiming for 60 million in 2030. So in another 11 years, double the number of tourists that we had last year. For a lot of people in Japan, I think it already feels that 
feels like there there is a huge number of tourists already. If you go to a town like Kyoto, which is basically Japan's most popular theme park, it can almost be called a theme park. It's, it's, it seems like a theme park when you live. It's covered in tourists. It's hard to find the locals amongst all the tourists. And in 10 years, they're saying that's going to double? Like, wow. So, a couple things now. New information. Spending from tourists has actually dropped a little bit. The numbers are off. I think this has a lot to do with the fact that uh, recently, a couple years ago, a lot of Chinese tourists were coming to Japan and they were spending tons of money just buying tons of stuff and taking it home. And the Japanese came up with a word for that called bakugai, which means like crazy shopping. And that has really kind of dropped off. It's not happening as much as it was before. So maybe that's where they're losing some numbers. I think you also have maybe a sort of smarter class of tourists now coming to Japan. Maybe more European tourists or American tourists and they're well-traveled and they they know the value and price of things and they don't just go out and just spend tons of money. And maybe Japan seems a little expensive to them. Or it's an exchange rate and who knows, there's a lot of factors. But obviously the Japanese government wants to balance the tourism and keep the tourists spending money and more money. Because that's the whole idea. Get people over, spend money, economy does better. Second big thing, the Japanese government, until uh, I think it said around 2014, the basic idea was just get the people over here and let it work itself out. Well, you know, just, just get them to come. We don't care if they Now, things have shifted and the government is making a concerted effort to promote the rural areas in Japan. The countryside. Smaller towns, villages, uh, off the beaten path kind of spots. They're making promotional videos showing foreigners walking around mountain trekking or taking cycling tours out in the countryside, going camping, rafting, you know, obviously all these kind of outdoor activities and things that you can do and you find in the great outdoors in the countryside in Japan. So they're making an effort to promote that. That's great. I think that's super important. But there are some problems with that. One being, <clears throat> is the countryside in that small little village that you're working so hard to promote, does it have the infrastructure to handle a huge wave of tourists? Is it, you know, everything in Japan is picturesque. Uh, I recently went to the island of Shikoku, where I'm going to be working on a new promotional video, and it was incredibly picturesque. It was just photogenic, you know, all these little countryside hills and farms and rice fields and you can take a photo of anything and it looks like a postcard. But it's not a tourist spot by any means. It's just countryside and farmhouses and people have lived there for years and years. And they're not really expecting or waiting for a huge wave of foreign tourists to suddenly show up. Some of them may be happy and some of them may be able to figure out ways to create businesses to make money off of that. But there's going to be a lot of people who are like, hey, get out of here. Why are you crowding up our single lane country road? You crazy foreigners driving on the wrong side of the road? So there's gonna be that. And the other thing is, if you don't have an infrastructure and you're not ready for a huge wave of tourists, oftentimes a foreign entity or a foreign corporation will come in and they'll realize there's a great opportunity there and they'll buy up all the land some of them will wait until the value increases and they'll flip it, make a bunch of money. And then others will build hotels, condominiums, and luxury accommodations. And then even other people will come in and they'll buy that for an even higher price. And the money starts rolling around and there's all this money, but none of it's really going 
to the locals. It's kind of all moving around in that foreign, foreign bank accounts. Going from one foreign bank account to the other. Except for the very first guy, who was the, the farmer, who sold his land super cheap because he didn't realize the value of it. Okay. So as you can see, there's, there's some issues here. We're bringing in a lot of tourists. Trying to send them out to the countryside now so there's a better balance. Because the countryside of Japan is really hurting. Population declining. Young people moving to the cities. No one wants to take over the farms and all the, the hard work. So the Japanese government also now trying to stimulate and try to loosen the rules on immigration. So not only are we bringing in tourists, but we're trying to bring in more foreigners to come and stay and live, integrate with the society. Hold on, got to turn the lights on again. A lot of tunnels around here. Um, so, I'm always thinking about this stuff, and I know I don't often have an answer or an idea that would be, you know, something like, wow, yeah, let's do that. I just sort of tend to rehash this stuff a lot, but today I had this great experience with the guy who gave me his canoe. And I wanted to tell you about it and then bring it back to close this conversation up. <clears throat> Foreign tourists love activities. And I know this for a fact because I've been told this by many people. And tourism organizations here in Japan they're being told by their own government to create, uh, like, basically tour companies. They call them DMOs, Direct Management Organizations, I believe it is. And they'll go in and they'll try to set up things like, you know, uh, horse trekking tours and uh, rafting tours and trekking and whatever. So that once the tourists get here, they'll have things for the tourists to do. It makes sense. But obviously, when you're out in the countryside in Japan, in a place that ever really was a tourist haven, they don't know and they don't have activities. Although there are tons and tons of great things here in Japan that can be turned into tourist-related activities. I mean, even simple things like, if you search for them, trying on a kimono and having your photo taken or doing a tea ceremony or any of these kind of cultural uh, things here in Japan, they're, they're great. You just have to know how to turn it into something that's attractive. Price it right, and advertise it, and then people are going to be like, yeah, I want to try that. So the government is kind of asking the local governments and these tourism organizations to make these activities and tours. But oftentimes, they just sort of come in with a copy-paste kind of attitude, and I think a lot of the things they're coming up with are not really that exciting or interesting. And then you have a situation where people are sitting on a pot of gold and they don't even know it. And that's what happened today. So I go out to get the canoe. This fella has his operation set up on the side of a small lake. He's got this great building there, reception, all the canoes laid out. There's a, a campsite that he also manages right next to there. And he takes people out on these canoe tours. Now, his heritage happens to be Ainu which is the original or aboriginal people of Hokkaido. And he was telling me how his ancestors used to hold uh, a ceremony on a small peninsula on the other side of the island. But they don't do it anymore. Apparently about 50 or 60 years ago, when the Japanese really came in, they, they made it a, a real tourism uh, activity and they would ship people over there and they would have the Ainu people hold this ceremony and everybody would take pictures and it was kind of like a, a tourism attraction and eventually his grandfather who was the Ainu leader at the time kind of got sick of it and said hey this is not a tourism thing this is just our ceremony that we do we don't need you people coming over here and taking pictures of us I understand and he basically shut it down. They used to have a little building on this peninsula where they would have their ceremony. He said it's, it's, it fell down, it's gone now. He took me over there on a motorboat. 
and they were picking some wild vegetables in the forest. I walked out on the peninsula, I flew my drone, I took some photos of it. It was incredible. It was, it was a great experience. There were deer tracks in the sand from wild deer. It was amazingly quiet. It was this perfectly shaped peninsula. I could see the remnants of the building that had been there. It was a small stone like shrine little object that was still there. I took a photo of it. It was, it was what people like to call in Japan a, a power spot. You know, there was obviously, you know, something, a, you could feel a, a presence and sort of a spiritual nature in the place. I was like, I was really impressed. And we got back on the boat, came back and I was like, man, thank you. That was like a, you know, not only did I receive a great canoe and trade, but he, he showed me this amazing spot and I got this this experience and I was basically being a tourist and so as I'm driving home I was thinking about that and I was like wow you know he's sitting on a great piece of content and he doesn't even know it because he's so close to it he's just you know that's what his grandfather did he was raised in that area lives right across the lake doesn't think about it. And I'm like, wow, you know, you got the boat, you got the place, you could take people over there, you could rebuild that little hut, you could, you don't even have to do the ceremony, it's showing people a piece of history and telling them what happened there. Someone's got to be interested in that. Am I not? Am I? Let me know if you think that's wrong. So, my thought was, there needs to be more uh, communication, workshops, uh, lectures, whatever it is and whatever it takes to stimulate new ideas, especially for younger people like this fella who I met. He already owns a business and he's just looking for more activities, more contents, more things that he can bring and show to bring in the tourists. He just doesn't know that he's sitting on a pot of gold. So he needs someone like me to come and experience it and go, hey, this is what you need to do. Put this in a package, put a price on it, and you're going to get people to come. Mm. So the other thing that he told me, and this will be my closing point, where he's located it's kind of, it's, it's, it's right on the edge of the, or it's, I guess it's in the National Park there. Uh, there's a train that runs from the large city of Kushiro up to another city called Abashi. And it stops very close to where he is, uh, at the train station there. And it's in the middle of nowhere. There's nothing around it. But when the train comes in, he said it's like a, it's like a big uh, transportation Mecca. Like all these buses come in, everybody gets off the train, they get on these buses, and you'll see all these tourists, and then suddenly, buses all take off, the vans disappear, and everybody's gone. And no one comes to his business, which is right there. He's on a beautiful lake with canoe tours and trekking and all these opportunities, and he doesn't see any tourists, because they ship him off to other locations. Mm. This is another problem in Japan. A majority of the tourists come in and use public transportation. So everything is kind of controlled, monopolized, and limited to the public transportation that is available. And although Japan is bringing in more tourists, a lot of times in the countryside, as a cost-saving measure, they're cutting back on all the public transportation. So, for example, that train that runs between Kushiro and Abashiri, he said they've been cutting back the schedule so there's less and less trains. So you'll take one in the morning and you won't be able to come back until late at night. So that's making it really tough. So this is two things that really need to be worked on. It's increasing the opportunities for tourists to go to these 
sort of more minor destinations instead of just taking people from the airport to the big hotel where they spend some money at the convenience store and the gift shop. Then they get back on the bus and go to the next hotel. And there needs to be more learning and more help for the locals and the small business operators in all these little tourism regions to realize their full potential and come up with creative new activities and tours and contents and things that people can do. Because there is so much, and I'm, I'm just talking about Hokkaido and the areas I know, but this is true for all over Japan. There is so much that can be packaged and brought to the attention of tourists. Japan is a tourism haven. And I, okay, one more thing, and this will really truly be my final closing comment because the sun is setting. Oh, it's beautiful. I think really going forward, not only for Japan, but for the whole world, uh, tourism is really the, the only way forward. I keep thinking about this, and I'm listening to all these different podcasts talking about all these serious subjects, and I don't know if anyone's ever said this, but I think tourism is the only way to save the whole planet. I think if the entire global economy was truly tourism based, meaning everybody just travels everywhere to experience everyone else's cultures and foods and lifestyles and whatever. First of all, there would be a lot less hate and a lot less war going on because no one wants to go and be a tourist where there's war going on. It just doesn't work. And once you've gone to a bunch of countries and seen many cultures and met many different people, your ideas open up and you learn that it takes all kinds and you, you become a much uh, more gentle person with more diversity. I really believe that. And so I think it's great what Japan is doing, you know, opening up and bringing in these tourists and people getting to really experience Japan. And the same should be, should be all over the world. So hopefully uh, Japan can be a really good model case for other countries that are still, uh, still not there yet. Okay, I hope we got through a couple things there. It was pretty long-winded as always. Uh, I, hope I, uh, I hope I don't erase this one. So if you're, if you're seeing this on YouTube, on my channel, then it means I, I let this one slip through and it, it made the cut. Sometimes I record these and I go, nah, that was, that was a bunch of bullshit. But uh, I think this one was okay. Hope you enjoyed that. As always, please leave some comments. Leave lots of comments. I enjoy them. Someone recently left me a comment that was very nice. It said, great content. What do you think about investing in a mic, a microphone? It would make it a lot better. <laughs> uh, yeah, I agree with that too. I just, uh, it's just so easy to throw the, the GoPro up on the dashboard, you know. It takes so much more work to put on a microphone. Uh, I'll work it out one of these days, folks. Maybe when Carmentary is sponsored. Hint, hint, sponsors. All right, see you guys next time. Drive safe. If you like to drive around and talk about the latest happenings, this is the channel you need. So subscribe and follow Carmentary.